Now, if we are putting genes to one side, and I'd just like to park them as necessary but not sufficient, that's not the answer to what makes you so special. What makes you different from the person sitting next to you? If you put your brains on your lap, and when I did this some seven-year-olds, they went like this, trying to take their brains out. <laughs> if you put your brains on your lap, then you wouldn't at first blush see much difference any more than if your heart was on your lap or your lungs and so on. But whereas your heart and your lungs can be transplanted, your brain cannot. You might want someone else's brain to be transplanted, but sadly, <laughs> clearly that's not. So somehow your brain, that sludgy thing that at first glance looks so like everyone else's, is a part of your body, is an organ of your body. Why is it that no one has got one like you've got ever? And for the 100,000 years we've stalked the planet, no one will have a brain like yours ever again. And indeed, you won't have a brain like yours by tomorrow. It's changing all the time. So what is the basis? You're evolving. You're having different consciousness states. You're having different thoughts, different ideas. You're revising your views. Well, I hope you revise your views from time to time. Yeah, so um, what is it that makes you so special and so evolving? Well, let's call that the mind, and we have to think about what the mind is. And here, we start to think about how we are different from goldfish. Well, perhaps you're not thinking that, but let's think about that. Yeah. Um, if you had a goldfish or your kids had a goldfish and the goldfish died, you could sneak off to the pet shop while the kid was at school, purchase another goldfish. And let's be brutal, the child would know no difference. Perhaps someone's going to defend now they've got a goldfish with a great personality, but I don't think you'd have a very strong claim for that. Yeah. Uh, you couldn't do this exercise of replacement with a cat or dog, and certainly you couldn't do it, although they might want you to. Um, with their brothers or sisters. So, so what is it, as we get more sophisticated and more complex, that makes humans especially, more so than cats and dogs or other primates? What makes you so individual? Well, the answer lies in what happens to you after you're born. The brilliant thing about being born a human being is that although you're born with pretty much all the brain cells you'll ever have, the growth of the brain after birth is caused by the huge proliferation of connections, not the number of cells. They're there. It's the connections. And you can see here, in the first two years of life, the blobby bits are the brain cells, the stringy bits are the connections. The blobby bits are not that changed. Look at the proliferation in the stringy bits. Now, why is that important? Well, even if you are a clone, an identical twin, you are going to have a unique configuration of brain cell connections. Why? Because they are driven and shaped and strengthened and atrophy as a result of your individual experience your individual experience alone. Yes, I know you might share the same family and so on, have similar experiences, but no one has identical experiences to you in the same time and space. So let's have a look at why this is so important. This is what, in the jargon, we call plasticity. Of course, it doesn't mean the brain is plastic. It means that it's highly malleable, from the Greek plastikos, to be moulded. And there's two examples I want to show you, one very famous and one that just makes one real in terms of the implications. The first one concerns this brain area called the hippocampus. So just in case you're getting a bit fed up with all this technical stuff, just have a look at this rather aesthetic picture, which I think would be lovely just, just to look at, you know, sort of hanging up at the RI, perhaps. Yeah. Um, the blobby thing is, of course, the neurons, and then you can see these lovely branches. These cells have been stained 1 in 10, so you can see, see them in stark relief. And so this area is called the hippocampus, and you might wonder why I've suddenly again brought this up. It is because it's an area an area, not the area, an area relating to memory. And the reason it's so interesting is it featured in a fascinating study a while ago of, of all people, you may have heard this study, London taxi drivers. Now, London taxi drivers, as we know, um, learn this ominous test, this frightening test called the knowledge, where you navigate all the streets of London from memory, and you can do so without recourse to a manual, you know, all the one-way systems. And let's be honest, they do make a, a good fist of that compared to other cities and, and countries and so on. They do do very, very well. It does mean they have a huge burden on their working memory. And in this ingenious study, incidentally led by a woman scientist, get that in, Ellen Maguire, um, she found that if she scanned the brains of London taxi drivers, then this area, the hippocampus, was bigger, was bigger in London taxi drivers than people of the same age. And this fact is not lost on London taxi drivers. They've, uh, uh, they, next time you get into a taxi, ask if they've heard of the hippocampus. <laughs> and they have. And it's not that having a big hippocampus predisposes them to being a London taxi driver, because the difference is more marked for the longer that they've been driving. Use it or lose it. That's the example of plasticity. 
Now, look at this one. There's even more. Actually, no, I'm not, I'll come to the other one in a minute about piano playing. Um, what could be the basis of this? Well, this is, again, something that makes you really think in terms of the isolated and enriched environments. So this time we have rats rather than mice. And again, the isolated environment and the enriched environment, that's to say they're housed together and they're on ladders and the like. Um, let's look at a single brain cell. You can't do this in humans, of course. That's why it's rats. Single brain cell from each of these groups who are otherwise identical. And you can see what's happened, and this is what makes it so fascinating, is simply interacting with the environment has produced a structural change at the level of the brain cell. Look carefully, um, because if you're not familiar with this necessarily, it might look similar at first. Blobby bits are the brain... You're getting used to this, I'm sure. The blobby bit is the brain cell. Now, look at these branches, which I just alluded to a while ago. Can you see they are sparser in the rat from the isolated environment compared to his counterpart in the enriched environment. So what's happened is simply interacting more and stimulating the brain more has caused the growth. The brain cell has become more active, and that in turn has made it grow more so that it's got more branches. Why should it be important to have branches? Well, what you need to know is when we talk about brain cell connections, it's not a connection of one to one, but a brain cell will have up to 100,000 connections wanting to converge and make it as its target. Yeah. So, therefore, it follows the greater the surface area of the brain cell, the more connections it can make. You might start to see where this is headed now. You stimulate the brain. The brain cells become active. They respond by growing more potential target areas so that they can make more connections. So, this is the experiment that I wanted to show you that I find astonishing, um, again, back in humans. I'm sure many of you play the piano or you have kids who play the piano. Um, and this was a wonderful experiment um, involving adult human volunteers, none of whom ever played the piano. And uh, they were divided into three groups. As always, the poor old control group get the short straw, and they just had to stare at piano for five days. <laughs> well, they're not allowed to see it, just the experimental sessions. Um, the second group learnt five-finger piano exercises. Fine, and we're going to see what the difference is with the brain scans over five days, even just five days, of people just doing a certain activity, how that changes in the brain. But there was a third group, and the third group, the most interesting of all. So let's look at them. So let's look first at the control group, the five-day period. OK, so you can see that um, over five days, the brain is literally, literally unimpressed. <laughs> literally, yeah, it's just the same. But look at the top, the physical practice... Can you see astonishing, over five days, look at the significant growth in brain territory relating to digits, as shown by the expansion of the black blob, even over five days. Isn't that remarkable? But the middle group are the ones that make you think. These were people who just had to imagine they were playing the piano. <laughs> just think what this means. First, we know, for example, what people report when they imagine playing golf, they then play golf better. Um, so it does mean that you can rehearse in your mind certain things, and then that actually will have an impact on uh, physical performance later. But it also means for me, if one adopts a more philosophical stance, that this is the basis of a thought. All these people have done is to think. And by thinking, they have changed the connectivity of their brains. So any, any philosophers here? They're not going to show themselves. Oh, there's one, bravely putting your hands up. Two! Yeah, I'm, I'm sure you may have thoughts on this, because... If you are traditional philosophers, I've bumped up as a neuroscientist with philosophers talking about the mind versus the brain and mental versus physical. And I would show you this and say that surely here, even here, there's lovely, sophisticated, exotic thoughts that we have, insubstantial though they might seem, do have some kind of physical purchase in the brain. And I find this really something that one could talk about all evening. 